welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Risha Bergstrom. She is a radiologist and she's the founder of the Physician Philanthropist. We're going to talk about her Kevin MD article, how you can donate effectively after tragedy. Risha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited about it. We'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, share your story and journey to where you are today. Well, it hasn't been a very direct route, I've got to say, but my interest in philanthropy really came about nine years ago when I found myself on the receiving end of other people's charity. And I had already been a practicing radiologist for quite some time, so I hadn't expected to need help in any way that that way. But when I was away for what was supposed to be a three-day trip when I was 32 weeks pregnant, I ended up delivering early out of state with a baby who needed to be in the NICU for about six weeks. And so I was completely without any resources and things like that. And I ended up at the Ronald McDonald house living there for six weeks. And, and I really came to rely on the people who were helping me. And I was really touched by it. And I realized that kind of the little things that I had been doing along the way and not thinking that they really made any difference actually do make such a difference. So now many years later, I'm living somewhere where people are making huge financial impacts around me. I'm in Northern California and there's a lot of people who are able to do a lot of impactful good. And I was feeling like I still wanted to be able to make a difference, even though I didn't have the billions or millions to give. And I've been thinking a lot about what I had gone through and what I experienced and how much I wanted people to understand that even if they don't have the, all that money to give, what they do give really does make an impact and it really can help. And as I was doing that, I was also learning that there are ways to give smarter mm -hmm. and increase the impact that you can have. Now, before we get into that, one of the things that you mentioned is that sometimes we're not sure of the impact one makes when donating. So can you give us some case studies or examples of what seemingly could be a small amount can make a big difference? Well, one of the things that I think about was when I was staying at, at the house there, I didn't have anything with me. So, and I was very, it was a very vulnerable and terrifying time. And the things that were surprising that I found so helpful were like the little, the toiletries, those little travel toiletries that a lot of us donate to different places. Mm -hmm. That was one of the great things to have that and, and the pantry foods. I didn't have to go grocery shopping. I was able to go into the pantry and just grab some food and not worry about it. So I felt like I was taken care of and I was able to focus on healing and my baby instead of, oh goodness, when's the last time I washed my hair? So these are, these are little things that actually do make a big difference to the people on the receiving end. And I think that that was kind of a, a surprising thing for me, how much of a difference those things make. So let's talk more about your Kevin MD article. And I think it's very relevant because whenever there is some type of tragedy, there's so many options when it comes to who we can donate to. And I'm never sure in terms of what to look out for. So I'm certainly interested in hearing your advice and guidance. So your Kevin MD article is titled, How You Can Donate Effectively After Tragedy. Now, for those of you who get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it, share the story why you decided to write it. Oh, sure. Well, unfortunately, there have been a lot of horrible things happening. And I found that people were coming to me and asking me, well, what can I do to help? Where should I donate? What should I do? And what I'm interested in is people em empowering themselves to figure out where is right for them to donate. Because what I care about may not necessarily be what other people care about or the way to go about it. And one of the things that really struck me is when people would say, what can I do? Often they had already done something. Often they had already made some kind of donations to different organizations, but they still didn't feel like they were making a difference or doing anything. So I was struck by those things and I wanted to give people a little bit of a framework about how to think about things because these are incredibly complex and difficult issues and there's no one right answer or way to go about things. And so I wanted to give a little bit of 
background about how to think of it. And I, I think of it in kind of three different steps. The first step that I have in the article is to find your focus and to ask in, in any situation, in any kind of tragedy, what's the thing that is most important to you that relates to this tragedy? So if it's something like the war in Ukraine, what can I do about that? Well, <laughs> it's a huge complex topic, but if it's if you already have an idea of what you care about most and what you want to focus on, it can be something like, well, I want to help my fellow doctors who are working out there. And then it can help you kind of start to find a little bit focus and start to narrow down what you want to help with. Or if you think about, I want to be able to help the displaced children or children who are disrupted and going through trauma. How can I help the children? So if, if you start out by finding your focus, that can help you figure out the next step. And part of the finding your focus is also figuring out and thinking a little bit more deeply about what's called the theory of change in philanthropy is if you do one thing, what do you expect to be the outcome of that thing? So I gave examples in the in the article about gun violence because there's been a lot of that unfortunately as well and there are a lot of different ways to to approach that so for example if you think that if we enact stricter gun control laws or we have better enforcement of the existing laws then we'll have fewer of these tragedies then that's what you would want to focus on but if you are concerned about perhaps mental health or racism or things like that being contributors then those are the things that you can focus on. So that's the first step is really finding your focus. So and before then, moving on, I just want to ask in terms of helping to clarify our focus. So let's say if there was a tragedy on the other side of the world where we're just not clear in terms of what the options and issues are, how do we go about kind of researching the different avenue that one can donate to, the different causes that is specifically related with that particular tragedy? Where can we go about finding out more about that? That's a great question. And one of the things I actually look at when I'm trying to understand what those possible different focus areas might be is on Charity Navigator, there's actually a tab. So on a lot of these charity evaluation websites, they do have a tab that has something called hot topics or something like that, where it's the most recent tragedies that people are feeling moved to make a difference. And if you go on to their hot topics tab, it actually breaks down like these are the different things that they believe are contributors. And here are some examples of groups th that are focusing on these different paths to being able to help. So there's a lot of information there that can help you start finding your focus if you haven't already figured out your own personal focus. All right. So once we've found your focus, we move on to the next step. So moving on to the next step is really assessing your options. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, doing something like looking on the, the hot topics on a charity evaluation website, that can be really helpful. But what I like to do is once you, once you kind of have an idea, you can just research and Google and see what you find there. The charity evaluation websites can be really helpful for listing different options, but I do recommend being very careful about what kind of information you take away from those websites because they do have certain specific, very helpful information, but they also um, can be a bit misleading in using things like expense ratios to decide if something is an effective charity or not. And that's not actually evaluating the effectiveness of the organization, but actually their their expenses. And that's not that's not necessarily a, a helpful proxy. So when you're evaluating it, it's a good place to start and to think about because they'll be able to give you an idea of kind of a a list of charities that you might be interested in if you haven't come across them. But aside from that, I do recommend doing at least two other things once you've found a charity. One is to Google the charity itself or search up the charity itself because you want to see, make sure that what they're, that what's being recommended is really a valid one that's aligned with what you want to accomplish and what you want to help with. And the second thing is really to spend even a few minutes on the website of the organization that you're interested in contributing to because those websites usually have a lot of information and can let you know where your money would be going and how they're going to evaluate their 
impact and what kind of outcomes they're looking for and can give you a much better sense of if your money is going to where you want it to go to. <laughs> now, sometimes I hear that some charities, not all of your money is going to the cause that's necessarily on the website. So as someone who is not versed in terms of all the different organizations that are out there, what are some red flags that we should look out for? And, and how do we know for sure that charity is saying they're doing what they're doing? That's a really great question, and it's not necessarily an easy one to answer. This, I, I think this is a very interesting question, and for I, I like to kind of pose it in a different way for doctors because I think it helps give an idea because there has been a lot of looking at charities really and how they function and what they use their money for. And they're a, a lot of times evaluated on this percentage is going to the actual cause and this percentage is going to the overhead and they can be judged very harshly in terms of how much is going to overhead versus the cause. And I like to compare that to, for example, in a radiologist who has a huge amount of overhead. We have very expensive machinery. We have a lot of requirements to be able to do our work. So we have a huge amount of overhead. And so if you think of that and how much would be going to the actual cause or the <laughs> doing mm -hmm. the exams, it's a different thing, or the actual radiologist compared to a primary care physician who might have much lower overhead and more of the money goes to the primary care doctors. So it, it kind of helps give a sense of the difference in, in the expectations. Both fill in very important roles in the care of a patient. So the same thing for charitable organizations. Some of the things that the organizations are trying to accomplish are really complex and they require a lot of either logistics or, or high functioning or highly educated and expensive executives or whoever it is who is who's working with the organization. And some really don't require that. So that's kind of my first word of caution in trying to judge a, an, a charitable organization according to those kinds of expectations. I would say the one of the ways that you can also look to an organization or look for red flags is if you search up the name in the exact words, in the exact order, and the words, and add the word either scam or fraud, mm. <laughs> you might be surprised at what you find. Like there are some, when you, when you search them up specifically with those words, that there, there are unfortunately some bad actors out there and you can find them often that way. All right. And let's talk about the third point in your framework. And that third point is take action. So tell us more about that. So that's simply just following through and really feel like you're following through. And this comes back to kind of that sense of what can I do to help, but you've already done something. What I hope for people to be able to do is if they've, if they've had a figured out their focus and figured out where they want to donate and have been a little bit more thoughtful about that, that when they actually do take action, when you actually do make a donation, that you feel like, okay, I actually have made a little bit of a difference. I have contributed somehow. And so one of the things that you can think about is, is this something that I care about that I just want to address this one time and do a one-time donation? Or do I want to do some kind of sustaining kind of donation, like a monthly donation to something that deals with the underlying cause or issues? Because I think this is a really important thing. So for that, something like a sustaining donation to something to an organization that you believe can really make long-term difference can be really helpful to those charitable organizations because when they know that they're not just getting these sudden influxes with a tragedy, but they have a budget that they can count on a little bit more, that can be really helpful. So that's one piece of it. And then again, just to feel like you've actually made a difference. One of the things that I do sometimes is I put in my calendar for the next year to follow up and go back to the website of the place that I donated and look look at what they have for their end of the year impact reports or financial reports. And then I'll see, okay, I might've only been able to contribute this much because again, I don't have the billions to contribute, mm -hmm. but my little piece helped move this piece forward. And it can be a very empowering thing and it can feel much more satisfying. And you can feel like you're making a difference if you go back and realize I was able to contribute a little bit towards these specific actions that were taken. 
We're talking to Risha Bergstrom. She's a radiologist and she's the founder of the Physician Philanthropist. We're talking about her Kevin MD article, how you can donate effectively after tragedy. Risha, so we have an audience of physicians here and physicians tend to be in a higher net worth demographic. So when it comes to contributing to a charitable organization, any physician specific pieces of advice that you could share with us today? Absolutely. One of the things that I learned about that I think is a really wonderful charitable vehicle is called a donor advised fund. These are a charitable investment fund almost, and mm -hmm. they you can uh, establish them in all kinds of different financial institutions like Fidelity or Schwab or whatever. And what you're able to do is you you can contribute into this fund and the whatever you contribute into, if you want to contribute something like appreciated assets, then you can you can donate them without having to pay capital gains tax. So it's a tax benefit for you there that's kind of a double tax benefit because you don't have to pay the capital gains tax and you can get the charitable deduction as well for a larger amount. And then you direct the, the people who manage the fund where you want the money to be put. And so it ends up that the organizations that you're trying to support also get more money. So that is kind of a win-win. It takes a few extra steps, but it's not very complicated. And it can be a way to kind of increase the impact of whatever charitable donations you want to make. And just to be clear, these donor advised funds are available at most major brokerages, correct? Yes, they are. Yes. And in terms of resources where one can read more about charitable organizations and perhaps do some of the research. I know that you mentioned a few websites already, but what are some websites off the top of your head that other clinicians can do more reading on? I do have a blog. So I've been writing on some of these topics. So that's the, the Physician Philanthropist blog, but I get a lot of my information. There's Stanford University has a social impact organization that is able to give you a lot of great information about donating. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? So I think I would just reiterate what I was saying before, which is that every little bit counts. You don't have to be donating a lot. And if you can donate a lot, that's wonderful. <laughs> but every little bit counts. And when you do make a donation, you should feel like you are making a difference in the face of any tragedy or any ongoing issues and that your money can be really a powerful tool and the most effective way to make a change in the world. And when you're doing it intentionally, when you've found your focus, either donating or investing or spending, whatever it is, it is a powerful way to make change in the world. Risha, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me.